Catholic Family Podcast presents Lent Around the World Daily Traditional Catholic Meditations Read by our friends from across the globe The Passion and Death of Our Lord Jesus Christ by the Most Reverend Albin Goodyear Chapter 2 Part 5 The Supper Here once more, St. John stands still for a moment in his narrative. To him, for the remainder of his life, this was a night no detail of which could ever be forgotten. All other memories might fade away, even that of the crucifixion, but not the recollection of that night, in which the heart of him who loved John and whom John loved revealed itself in all its magnificence. Before he tells his story, he pauses to consider. It was the night before the Pasch, as he chose to put it, they had been two days in Bethania, waiting for they knew not what, but with a strange sense of something momentous hanging over them. Jesus had seemed almost too absorbed with his own thought and prayer to remember the Pasch, and they had been obliged to remind him. The reminder had roused in him his wanted grandeur, calm and decisive and commanding, and he had sent two of them forward to the city, himself and Peter, guiding them by that vision of the future which they had long since learnt to trust. The rest had come up with him in the afternoon, and they had met together in a room worthy of the occasion, with all laid out for the Paschal Supper on a noble scale. How well now, when he looked back upon the scene, could John read the mind and heart of his beloved, as he had stood before them at the door of the room on that memorable night. They had gathered together in their usual way, eager enough about the purpose of their coming, for it was a great festival day. A little unmindful of him, among whom who was, nevertheless, their all in all. Intent upon their own affairs and the supper before them, taking little notice of the face, more than usually flushed, of the eyes more than usually bright, or of the whole body more than usually taut, that stood framed in the doorway before them, there he had stood for a moment and looked at them. It was the last time in this mortal flesh that he would have them around him. He knew it, though they did not. His hour was come, the hour of the enemy, foreseen from the beginning, was come at last. He must go. It was best for them that he should go. He must pass out of this world to the Father, and for that he could not but be glad. But for a time he must leave them alone, and that his human heart could not but feel. He loved them, how he loved them, deep down since that happy day by the Jordan when they had first sought him out, that love had always been there. But in the intervening years, human-wise, it had grown and grown. Generous, enthusiastic, responsive men they had been, all of them, Troublesome at times, yes, and narrow, often self-willed, and dull, but always willing to learn, always submissive under his rebuke, always giving back to him the little they had in the best way they knew. He loved them for it all. He had always loved them. Now at the end the very thought of separation made him love them, if possible, more than ever. Hence, as he comes to this scene in his narrative, John in his old age sees it all again, cannot but pause to look at it. He must give it an introduction all its own. He sums it all up in the solemn sentence. Before the festival day of the Pasch, Jesus, knowing that his hour was come, that he should pass out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them unto the end. They came into the room and sat down, or reclined, at the table. Jesus and the twelve, no more. Not even his mother was with them, although we shall soon have evidence enough that she was not far away. They sat down to the Paschal Supper. It was the first at which he had presided in the holy city. For the last year he had not come, remaining in and near Capernaum. The year preceding, he had not gathered his twelve, yet definitely about him. Now he had them together. Now with him they were a single family. Tonight was to be a sealing of the bond of union. 
how he had looked forward to it. It was the first thing he had to tell them. He could keep it to himself no longer. And when it was evening, when the hour was come, he cometh and sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said to them, With desire I have desired to eat this pasch with you, before I suffer. For I say to you, that from this time I will not eat it, till it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Before he suffered, what could he mean? Fulfilled in the kingdom? To what did he refer? Were not the two in contradiction? Of late more than ever he had spoken of suffering, and yet more than ever of late he had also spoken like a conqueror and had seemed on the verge of victory. All this week had been a record of success. The triumphant march on Sunday, the conquest in the temple, the applause of the multitudes, the defeat and submission of the scribes who dared not ask him any further questions, the surrender and retreat of the Pharisees. Were they not at that moment eating the Paschal Supper in peace, in that under the very walls of Annas and Caiaphas? No, whatever he might mean by suffering, clearly he could not mean defeat. Clearly the kingdom was at hand. He had but to give the sign, and his followers would rise to his command. That he would not eat the Pasch again until the kingdom came could only mean that before another year had run out, it would be founded. In this way, and with so much evidence to support them, they drew their conclusion. They discussed his words among themselves round the table. They were agreed that this could be their only explanation. What he next said and did only convinced them the more that they were right. As the supper went on, in his place at the head of the table, according to custom, he took the cup of wine in his hands. With the usual prayer, he turned his eyes to heaven and blessed the wine. Then he passed it round among them. And having taken the chalice, he gave thanks and said, Take and divide it among you, for I say to you that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine till the kingdom come. Confirm their conclusion? Did he not make it only too evident before the next Pasch? If his last words were to be taken literally, the kingdom would be theirs before the week was out. No wonder they grew sanguine and confident. No wonder they began to set all anxiety aside to become familiar with him, so commonly the case when he sat at table with them, and in consequence forgot his presence. They became preoccupied among themselves. The old subject of contention came up again, and they set to discussing their respective prospects in the kingdom. It was none too soon for them to prepare. There was Simon Peter, and there was Judas, for and against both of these there was something to be said. Both were leaders by nature, both had been exceptionally trusted by the master, yet both had their defects. One was overbold, the other perhaps overcareful. Perhaps on the whole their claims were equal, each excelling in his own sphere. There were the brothers, James and John, and there were the other brothers or cousins, James and Thaddeus and Simon. If the former were more intimate with the Lord, the latter were more nearly related. There was Andrew, who, after all, had been the first to discover and acknowledge him. But for Andrew, Simon might have never known him. There were Philip and Bartholomew, very early favorites, Israelites in whom there was no guile. In contrast with them, there were Matthew and Thomas, practical men, businessmen, men who knew the world and its ways and therefore would prove useful rulers. Yes, there was much to be said for every one. When the kingdom did come, what worthy princes they would make. And there was also a strife among them, which of them should seem to be the greater. Jesus listened, silent and apart, to all their busy wrangling. Poor little creatures, how often had he listened to this kind of thing before? Would they never learn? Even if they ignored him and his warnings, would they never discover their own right place? When before he had overheard them so contending with each other along the road in Galilee, had he not set a child before them 
and told them that if they would be truly great, they must become even as was that little child. When in Samaria they had wished to assert their importance, had he not rebuked them? In Perea, when they had thought to lord it over women and children, had he not checked them? When James and John had come to him with their mother to urge their plea for them, seeking the first places in the kingdom, had he not warned them plainly that the way to the first places was only through suffering? So recently as Tuesday last, only two days ago, when they had sat together on the slope of Olivet and had marveled at the beauty of Jerusalem beneath them, had he not made it clear beyond a doubt that their place in the kingdom, high as it would be, nevertheless would be also one of crushing lowliness, not one of glamour and splendour, would they never learn? What more could he do to teach them? But he would continue to be patient with them. After all, they were but children still, and they knew no better. What could they know of kingdoms and kings, but the tales that came to them from over the sea or across the desert? Tales of mighty monarchs in grand palaces, before whom all men bowed, and whom the world hailed as great and good in proportion to their wealth and power. It was true they did not dream that their kingships would be quite like any of these, Still, there was the glamour of it all about them, and these fishermen of Galilee could not understand how a king could be and not in some way resemble them. He must still be patient with them. He would be patient with them to the end. Tomorrow he would give them an example of kingship very different from what they had in mind. Some day, if not now, they would learn. And then when they were high, they would bend low. When they were low, they would not lose heart, but would know that even at their lowest, they were kings. Yes, he would be patient with them. He would remind them that, on their own confession, he was himself their supreme king. And yet, even now, he was a very different kind of king from those whose images danced before their eyes. He would remind them of what their own candidature for kingship had so far brought them. Little else but trial and sacrifice, only a share in the hard life and the persecution that had been his own lot. They had left all and had followed him. Therefore they should rule. That he had already promised them. He would repeat his promise. It might remind them of their own former generosity. And there was a strife among them which of them should be the greater. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and they that have power over them are called beneficent. But you, not so. But he that is the greater among you, let him become as the younger, and he that is the leader, as he that serveth. For which is greater, he that sitteth at table, or he that serveth? Is not he that sitteth at table? And you are they who have continued with me in my temptations, and I dispose to you as my Father hath disposed to me a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and may sit upon thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. How he humored them on this night more than ever, speaking to them in the very imagery that most preoccupied them at the moment. Their minds were full of the kingdom. Their notions of kings were of monarchs, royal, crowned, administering justice at their ease. To them it was little more than a fairy tale, or at least a tale of a distant past. The throne of David and his mighty tower still standing in the north of the city, yet more of Solomon in all his glory, who exceeded all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom, and all the earth desired to see Solomon's face, to hear his wisdom, which God had given in his heart. Was that golden age about to come again? Or to come down to their own day, there had been Herod the Magnificent who had rebuilt the temple, and this other later Herod of whom they knew little more than that he feasted sumptuously and disposed of men and things according to his own undisputed will. Of course, when they were kings, they would not act like him. When they were kings, it would be very different. They would judge just judgment, 
they would be merciful and forgiving, according as he had so often told them. They would give alms to the poor. They would pardon enemies. They would see to the proper service in the temple. They would teach the kingdom. They would be loyal and devoted to their overlord. Oh, they would do wonders of good things when they were kings. But also they would eat and drink at his table. They would sit on thrones with crowns on their very own heads and would judge the twelve tribes of Israel. It would be a wonderful time. At long last, the millennium, and they, even they, would be in its very midst. So this night did Jesus at first humor these simple men from Galilee. And yet all the time he was teaching them that which later, if not now, they would understand. One day, not long hence, they would know what was meant by his kingdom not of this world, the kingdom whose king was a servant. He had told them plainly enough many times before. Now he would emphasize the teaching by an act which none of them would ever forget. The Paschal Supper was over. Everything had been done in strict accordance with the ritual. The eyes of Jesus traveled once more round the group about him. He read their faces, faces for the most part easily read, and through them he read their hearts. He saw their strength and their limitations. He knew how far they could be trusted and where they would fail. One of the group in particular stood out amongst them, and the sight of him crushed his soul. Judas was there, Judas of Carioth, the man of affairs, whom on that account the rest had learnt to respect and in some sense to follow. Judas, the one well-balanced mind among them, who was never deceived by enthusiasm, who never made mistakes, who knew the value of things and men, who never trusted others too much, who could be relied upon to set matters right when the folly of others put them wrong, who never lost his self-control no matter how much he stirred others, who was prudent and wise and foreseeing and careful, and always a good reason for everything he did. Judas, who kept the purse and saw to its replenishment. Judas, the son of Simon, whose prudence and common sense had read more clearly than the rest the recent repeated warnings of the master. He had read and he had decided. Whatever was being said round the table, he knew the ship was doomed. He had determined not to perish with it. No man in his senses would do that. Common prudence had guided him. It was his duty to look to himself. Wise men in Jerusalem had praised him for the step he had taken. Since the master and his cause must perish, he had done no more than secure himself and had profited, as was only right, by the transaction. All this... Jesus read in the heart of Judas. He knew it all, yet till this moment he had said and done nothing. He knew he was the Lord of all things, that the Father had given all things into his hands, yet he said and did nothing. He knew that he came from God and goeth to God, that he was the Holy One and true, yet to hinder Judas he said and did nothing. He knew he had but to ask the Father, and he would give him legions of angels for his defense. Yet in the presence of Judas, thus far at least, he had shown no sign of resentment. He had said and done nothing. But now he must do something, even if he did not yet speak. Had he not willingly been called the friend of publicans and sinners? And was not Judas one of these last? Had he not said in times past, Come to me, all you that labor and are burdened, and I will refresh you. And was not Judas at this moment burdened as no other man upon this earth? Had he not said, I was sent for the lost sheep of the house of Israel? And was not Judas now the most lost of them all? Had he not declared that he would leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after the one that was lost until he find it? And was not Judas the very one? Was he not that same night about to announce that his life's blood would be shed unto the remission of sins? 
and did not Judas before him stand in need of that bloodshedding more than all the rest besides?' 